the pleasure. I'm, I'm very happy to introduce Tom Wisco. Um, now that Obama's president, actually, I would be happy even to introduce Mario Walter or Daniel Lewinsky. But I'm particularly happy to introduce Tom. Um, it's kind of a weird thing to introduce somebody who's a colleague and happens to be a friend and a faculty. So at a certain level, we take it for granted that we think that we know what he thinks and we know his work. Um, I promise him that I'm not going to make any jokes about his kind of movement and, uh, and other things, which for me is, is kind of a great sign of his passion and commitment with that projector. Um, everybody knows that Tom Fern is called a margin, which I always associate with bubbling water and uh, like something else. But I always thought that um, out of a Tom is part of a, a group of architects, of a generation of architects. His work have always had a particular quality to me, which make it always to struggle as something different and have a different sensibility to it. And it's the idea that his work have a clear sense of historical tradition or disciplinary knowledge. And it seems to me that that's the great challenge always for great architecture, to try to understand <coughs> where things are coming from and where they're going. And at a certain level, one could argue that the challenge for great architectures will never be in the present. So I think Tom Ward have that quality to be grounded, grounded in a certain tradition of discipline, but at the same time, have a level of curiosity for innovation and have always a promise of what architecture can be. So for sure, I think we can take for granted certain things that we know about him. And I hope that the lecture today can show us where he works, his work can show us a promise of where it can be. So, and it, Tom. teaching here for about two and a half years this time around and um, it feels like, to lecture here feels like to be almost re reintroduced and that's a nice thing, I guess. Um, because as Hernan said, you know, you can teach here and, and I guess your, your views come out in, in reviews and in your classes, but, uh, but it's, it's really, for me, it's quite different than having a chance to really um, go on and on about, <laughs> about, um, about the work, <laughs> hopefully not on and on and on about the work. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, so, and of course, as architects uh, always have, I have too many slides, so if I start skipping through, don't be concerned, um, I may do that. Okay, so I want to start with this image, which is something that motivates me to, uh, to do most of my work. Uh, uh, this is a picture of, of really 99% of architecture. It is a picture of, of ductwork on the ceiling, uh, not at all integrating with the structural system or the tectonic system of, uh, of the rest of the space. So you have a, basically a, a CMU wall, you have glue lamp beams, and then you have these ducts which are completely at odds with one another. And um, I guess I would have to say that my work is probably distinguished by the fact that it, it, um, it takes on the relationship between building systems and, um, in particular, structural and mechanical systems, and in an effort to kind of resolve these differences, not necessarily to make them homogenous, but, but um, to try to find new kinds of forms and new spaces through the, the negotiation of different kinds of building systems. So I guess, you know, structural, mechanical, and also building envelopes. Um, so here's a good model for uh, for a lot of our work, this is a, a giant lily pad. It's five feet in diameter, and the interesting thing about the lily pad is that it tries to maximize its surface area uh, um, to maximize photosynthesis, but of course what starts to happen is that the leaf folds down underneath and it begins to sink, so it develops this huge veiny um, under, underbelly which, um, which supports it, and it has two different kinds of qualities to it. One is a branching system that branches more and more um, towards the outside, and then also this kind of 
uh, micro branching inside of each cell which supports the leaf, uh, uh, which creates a kind of continuous structural system. Um, if you look in nature, one thing that's, that's, uh, that's everywhere in nature are, uh, are um, multi-optimized or multi-objective systems. In this case, if you look at the buttress tree on the right, it's, it's, uh, it's a kind of tree that grows anywhere where the, the ground is, um, I'm sorry, this keeps turning off. Anywhere where the ground is, is very soft. And so it develops these huge webbed roots that, um, that give it structural support. Uh, but of course it's not an idealized structure where it would grow out in a star shape, let's say a six-sided or seven-sided or eight-sided star. It is also responding to the differential qualities of nutrients and liquids and chemicals uh, uh, in the ground. And so it... Uh, should I just stay here? Okay. Hello. Hello. Okay, hopefully this works better. I'm just going to try to stay still here for a second. Um, so anyway, what, what you end up getting is a... Um, Is a, is a highly differentiated and, um, and, and kind of exotic structural system that's driven by multiple parameters, not just structural parameters, but also in this case, let's say, mechanical parameters. Uh, sorry guys, one second. Okay, let's try that again. Okay, so uh, the other one that you may, may be familiar with is the, the dragonfly wing, which um, I, I talk about a lot. Um, the, the amazing thing about the... <laughs> Can you just turn that off? Yeah, I'll just talk. It's fine. Sure. Yeah, it's totally fine. Okay. So, so the, um, the amazing thing to me about the dragonfly wing is that uh, it's got two different kinds of pattern logics running through it. And, uh, and the combination of those is that which creates the performance of the wing. So uh, um, the first pattern logic is the kind of ladder logic, which you see on the leading edge of the wing, uh, which, which operates like a beam, so it operates in bending. And that's also where uh, material begins to accumulate um, to create, uh, again, uh, stiffness in the wing. And that's also where you'll find in section that there's pleating going on in the wing to increase the performance. <coughs> now back here, where you see honeycombing in the wing, uh, that's where the wing is very flexible and can move. Uh, uh, for the aerodynamics of the wing. The most interesting part of the wing for me is the hybrid area here where the ladder type geometry and the, and the honeycomb geometry starts to hybridize. And you get the possibility for what, um, what we're calling in the office uh, beam brains. It's a hybrid of a membrane and a beam. So in, uh, in aerospace, this is, a, this is a joint strike fighter. And it's, uh, it's part of this amazing uh, industrial complex that is the US military, which basically breaks up jet design into several pieces for, uh, for lots of reasons. The first reason is, of course, security, um, to make sure that no single company has, the, has access to the entire design of a jet. Uh, but what's more interesting is that it's broken up based on the expertise of different firms. And, uh, and, and what comes out is a fighter which is based on a totally hybrid structural morphology, which, um, which is based on the expertise of each company. So you have McDonnell Douglas, you have Boeing, you have Raytheon. All of these people are contributing to the design of this thing without actually seeing the other pieces. So what you get is a, a, very, a totally varied um, a, a structural morphology where you have different kinds of patternings, you have different kinds of materials, like you have in the, in the, in the back fins, Ailerons is carbon fiber. You have aluminum and crepe, titanium, steel, and it's all it's all hybridized into, into something which is actually very high performance. Um, this is uh, this is a lizard skin. It's a desert lizard, and the the, the really interesting thing about this is that um, all of this stuff, which appears to be very very ornamental, and um, and beautiful is also um, highly efficient um, in moving liquid across the lizard's body. It's actually designed, well it's not designed, it, it evolved to <laughs> it evolved to direct liquids across the lizard's back when, when, when water condenses. 
um, to actually drain the liquid towards a lizard's mouth. So he captures the water in his mouth. So it's, it's quite amazing. You, you could, as an architect, understand this as a kind of uh, ornamental skin, or you could understand it as something that conducts flows of liquids. Uh, here's another guy, uh, the, the mimic octopus. And, you know, uh, he's so interesting. It, um, actually, a lot of people know about octop octopi and about their, their penchant for, um, for sh uh, color shifting and for camouflage. This guy is different um, in the sense that he doesn't really color shift, but he actually changes behavior, which I think is actually much more interesting. Uh, he, he, and nobody really knows why, but he takes on the different behaviors of different creatures in the ocean. In this case, he's, he's, or at least the theory is, that he's changing shape to become a turkey fish. And in this one, he's becoming some kind of, I don't know, like a sea cucumber. And here, he's a, he's a sea skate, you know, one of those flat fish on the bottom. And then there, he's a pair of sea snakes. He's actually hiding underground. Um, obviously, this has some kind of um, advantage. Of, um, in terms of natural selection, but what's really interesting is that he's, he's changing behaviors um, uh, in terms of, of adapting rather than, uh, than just camouflaging. So uh, maybe to loop this back into architecture a little bit, I, I would say that the work of my office um, is definitely uh, aligned to, to an interest in nature and in biology and in adaptive systems and in anything basically that's about the local. This goes for structural systems, in the case of Nervi, um, uh, where you're looking at local adaptation of structural systems in response to, to uh, uh, particular shaping environments. In this case, he is accepting the, the existence of vertical columns, and he's letting the, the roof begin to differentiate and, and let forces flow into the columns. Whereas you have Mies, who is, in my opinion, a conceptualist, and it appears that he's interested in structure because there is structure exposed everywhere, and there are lots of elements exposed. Um, but in fact, there's no local differentiation whatsoever. Um, in fact, he's gone out of his way to, to remove the columns to the exterior of the roof. There's no differentiation in the depth of the roof based on where the columns are located. And it's basically about kind of infinity. Does this one work now? this again. Um, there's a kind of infinity and a, and a, um, a universalism implicit in the work of, of Mies. So, um, now, <coughs> this car, this is the Mazda Furi, which is, which is something that, that intrigues me because it, is, um, it was sold when it came out recently, actually just last year, it was sold by, by its designers as, as extremely high performance. And of course, these air intakes here are intended to be, you know, uh, uh, intended to cool the engine, um, uh, we are told. And the interesting thing about that is that, is that it's, it's quite obvious that there's a lot more going on here than just pure performance. And it, it goes beyond that towards a kind of ornamental sensibility, which, uh, which is super interesting to me, where it actually, it does, it does perform, but it does so in a way that is, let's say, excessive, um, to the point that it even creates, uh, it even takes on color as another effect of these, of these openings, these cavities, and even lighting is embedded inside of the pleats, um, LED lighting. So it goes, it, it performs, but it goes beyond pure performance towards something which may be um, baroque. Now, uh, yeah, fashion. Armor is, is really cool to look at because uh, you'll find um, when you're trying to optimize weight and strength in armor, uh, you have to use a lot of different geomet geometrical patterns in surfaces in order to increase strength. So in this one, pleating uh, is, is, is amazingly ornamental, but of course it's structural as well and, uh, and very strong. And, um, and then also if you look at uh, contemporary wetsuits, uh, again, they're, they're, they're designed around the human body and around particular movements of the human body to allow um, complete rotation of arms and legs, but at the same time it has this kind of tattoo-like sensibility to it, which, which um, again doesn't cancel out the performance of it, but it adds to it in a way where it's, uh, things are confused, the ornamental qualities and the performative qualities. Um, this is something that 
I've been looking at it for a couple of years, and I haven't yet been able to figure out how to do it at the architectural scale, but it's something that I intend to. Uh, and that is structural color. This is the wing of a Luna Moth, and it's not just a black and white image of the Luna Moth wing. In fact, moth wings um, at the nano scale are white. They're color colorless, and they're optimized for weight, which means they have a lot of pores in them, and for strength, obviously. But the most interesting thing about them is that these pores are simultaneously uh, um, uh, um, organize to generate color. So different pores have different depths, and that allows different wavelengths of light to penetrate, generating color. So you have, again, a kind of multi-objective environment here where uh, structure is optimized and operating, but you also have color effects that come out of it. Um, here's another guy who does that. This is the blood cone jellyfish who uh, amazingly is actually two creatures interwoven. Uh, they're co-evolved together. The one creature is, is, a, um, is a transparent jellyfish, which, which moves itself around by rotating these combs. And the other creature is bioluminescent bacteria. And basically, it's a negotiation between the two where, uh, where the bioluminescent bacteria gains access to more food and has kind of safety by, by being embedded in the, in the combs. And the jellyfish gets these color effects, um, which, which uh, when blended with the uh, sun bouncing off the water above, creates a kind of stealthing mechanism for the jellyfish against its predators. Now, in the office, we tend to work with hybrid geometries, things which try to do more than one thing at once. And we started to collect these geometries into a kind of almost insect collection. And uh, they're hanging all over the wall in the office. And these are just a couple, I wanted to show a few, um, where, let's say, the, the one at the top starts to take on the issue of primary, secondary structure, and, um, and floor slab. And it starts to hybridize it to create something which is um, through pleating, which is structural, but can also possibly conduct um, uh, mechanical flows of, of air or liquid. And the one below that is another option, which is the surface. If that's the surface to pleat, this is the surface to armature, which is where a surface can actually sprout and reconnect to itself to create a kind of primary structure. So you have an extreme, extreme division between very micro and very thin, and then very heavy. So you have sort of primary and tertiary, but you remove the secondary construction. And this is another one which goes from uh, a, um, a shell-based structure to a vector-based structure, uh, um, or a surface-to-strand structure, which is what we're calling it around the office. And that means basically that you, you design a shell that, um, that can differentiate between opaque and open, and it can start having ribbing that, can, that, is, um, that is depth variable. But after a certain point, if you look at, um, at a lot of kinds of construction, after a certain point uh, of depth, it becomes uh, uneconomical. So the idea of, of, the, of the shell to vector is that at some point, it actually snaps and, um, and goes from, from, uh, from deep ribs to a kind of space frame type, type construction. So it's another one. And here's a few others that we've generated along the way. There are all kinds of, all kinds of geometries. And I would, I would like to say about them that they're all sort of in-betweens. They're all transformative geometry. So we're trying to generally go from a surface to a pleat, or from a volume to an armature, or uh, from, as I said, from a surface to a strand. Um, so as I said before, biology is a, it's a huge, um, it's a huge uh, inspiration for, for the office. And not just in terms of like this collection of animals that I'm showing, but also in terms of evolutionary processes. And, uh, and, and one thing I'd like to say about that is, is that a lot of times evolutionary processes are misunderstood and, and people tend to simplify them. Um, they tend to make the assumption that, that um, things are getting better and that structure gets, uh, should always get better or more efficient. And I would just like to point to the example of the hammerhead shark in the ocean, which is, uh, is actually quite a freak in terms of sharks. <laughs> it's, uh, it's one of the most clear examples in nature of how 
the um, autoimmune the mutation part of the mutation and fitness testing loop of natural selection is so important for evolution. Um, the shark, the, the hammerhead shark, in fact, didn't evolve over time from the small hammer to the very large hammer, which is a lot of times the assumption. In fact, the, the, um, the, the winghead shark, the huge hammer, was the first one to appear, and it was, um, it was, it was a, it was an, it was a mutation, and which is basically um, started to appear in different parts of the ocean, based on based on shaping environments in different sizes and lengths and depths. So all of the other sharks came after the after the winghead shark. They're all optimized for their particular environment, um, and and this really strange thing about the hammerhead is that. The fact that its eyes are now on the end of the hammer are not necessarily an advantage at all. In fact, it really has trouble hunting because of that, and that's one of the reasons why it swims like this. Um, so what it has developed over time after the mutation is the ability to, um, to smell better during its hunt. Uh, but the, the original thing about the hammerhead is that, is that it came from nowhere, and it wasn't an obvious um, uh, a positive advantage in terms of evolution, but that it started with a mutation and it, and it optimized over time. Um, I think I'll do this guy. So, again, thinking about evolution, another interesting uh, example of, of how evolution sometimes doesn't quite do what we think it's going to do is the, the bottlenose dolphin on the right. Um, in 2006, it was discovered that the bottlenose dolphin, in fact, um, uh, wasn't always in the ocean. That it used to look like that, a wolf <laughs> with four skinny legs and a long tail. And that goes against, again, kind of common, common knowledge that most things started in the ocean and then crawled up on the land, became long fish, and then became creatures on, on, on land. And so, in this case, that is what happened, but then this guy, because he was hungry or whatever was going on, crawled back into the ocean. So uh, that's a really interesting part of evolution, again, is that you, you can't expect things to go kind of unidirectional. So there are a few things, uh, um, just to make a few statements about the work before I show some projects, things that uh, I guess I'm, I'm working on and trying to stick to. Uh, first of all, that we're working on complex structures, but not the best of all possible structures. Um, meaning that uh, if you look at nature, nature always has redundancies, and um, and we're also looking for complexity, which um, uh, is is not always uh, the best of all possible structures, and not always the most efficient or economical structures. Um, the other thing is that uh, we're we're looking for things that can maybe culturally understood as ornamental, but trying to make those things do work. Which, is, which has become more and more important in the work in the last few projects. And um, what else do I want to say? And evolutionary processes, which we've been involved with, with Barrow Happold especially, are only useful if they involve, if involve random mutations um, uh, as well as, as optimization. So I think that there's a, there's a lot of talk about optimization recently, but to me that's um, actually just another word for um, the search for efficiency which is, to me, um, not that generative in terms of, of making work. So, okay, so I've got about seven or eight projects. I'll start with an older one that people may know. This is in Prague, and it was for the Czech National Library in 2007. And the, it had a very, very strange site. It was, um, if people know Prague, this is the center of Prague, and um, uh, the site was way back here, over across the Vladva River and above the hillside, uh, pretty near the Prague Castle. And the program was a public library combined with, with a national archive. Uh, very interesting, uh, very important cultural building. And it was intended to have some kind of connection to the Prague Center and also to the Prague Castle. But one of the strange things in the brief was that the height limit that was given was uh, was. 14 meters, which is this height right here, which means that from the city center you would never would have seen it. So our proposal was to uh, go a little bit higher than that. We went to 60 meters. Uh, this is a view from the Tyne Cathedral in the center of Prague. That's the Prague Castle, and that's our building over there. So we went to a height of 60 meters. And somehow we got to the second phase with that move. Um, sometimes that works. <laughs> and so here's the project. 
the, um, one of the things about the program that was very important to the, in the brief was that the books in the National Archive had to be off the ground. They had just had huge floods in the Czech Republic and they lost a lot of their archives, so they wanted to have it off the ground. And so we decided to levitate a kind of volume up inside of a mountain-like shape and suspend the books so that the archive would be visible from everywhere in the building, but it would be accessible from almost nowhere. So we, we made that the crux of the design. So we started doing these you know, geometry studies where you know, um, we had an outer shell, a kind of protective shell almost, and, and how would we start to create this inner volume out of a set of, um, out of a surface in some cases, and in other cases, um, out of an armature, or the reverse, how to create from a volume a set of armatures that can create them out. So here's another study, or a later study. And here's what you get in section, is, uh, is again, you have the levitated archive, you have all of the office and support spaces over here, and then you have the reading rooms up here, which have direct access to the archive here and here. And this is the public library down below. So you have views from, from the library up to the top, and you have views from here down, but you have a completely separate security situation um, for the library. And here are the palm trees of Prague. <laughs> um, so I want to show that. So this is from below, from the public library, looking up. And this is this view I like a lot. This is from the mezzanine, looking down into the public library. Again, there's no circulation connection down below, but there's a visual connection. You also have a view out to the Prague Castle. There's the print. And this, the, this idea of nesting one volume inside of a second volume was really important for the project in terms of energy. Um, uh, it allowed us to basically do natural ventilation inside of all of these open spaces here where we weren't worried about the spaces at the top of the mountain. They could get very, very hot, for instance, in the summer um, because there's no, there's nobody up there. And um, so we had natural ventilation. We had um, geothermal heat pumps running um, chilled and, and heated floors. Uh, we could open up the shell in the summer to ventilate, to, to um, uh, force the natural ventilation to work. We also um, did uh, nighttime uh, flushing of hot air in the summer, and I guess most importantly, it was a completely separate buffer zone out here than it is inside of the archive, which is um, incredibly tightly controlled in terms of, of humidity and heat. So there it is at night. The next project is, is uh, was in Shenzhen in 2007. This is another competition. Actually, most things I'm gonna show tonight are competitions that we lost. <laughs> um, the, the Shenzhen Museum of Contemporary Art and Planning Exhibition, it was a, it's a really interesting project in a city that, that is only really 30 years old. Uh, it's built up uh, very recently and there are some, there are some huge, in my opinion, some huge zoning and planning mistakes going on there right now. Um, this is the center of the, uh, the Fudian district where there are some, it almost looks like American city planning in Washington, D.C., where you have, you have huge setbacks from the street. You have relatively small, iconic buildings in the middle of large blocks. Um, and the buildings are so overscaled, it's quite overwhelming. Like the city, the civic center is 300 meters, and this thing in the middle is the biggest book, uh, bookstore in all of China. Um, so our site over here um, was intended in the brief to be the final corner in a mega Chinese uh, courtyard house kind of thing. That, that was the idea from the brief, was that we create this intimate space by completing this mega Chinese courtyard. And so um, we thought, well, okay, that's not really possible. You can't just scale up a Chinese courtyard and expect the urban space to work the same way. So we decided to take on the, that idea of creating intimacy inside of our building and try to create an urban space that was that was intimate and um, not, a, not a reproduction at all of a Chinese um, courtyard house, but, but um, something that would offer um, a sanctuary from the city of Shenzhen. So this was the basic layout of the project. We made an L-shaped building, which you can see here is responding to the L-shape of the building on top. And then completing the building is a huge cantilevered roof which goes over a plaza. 
So the building has basically three parts. It's got a plaza, it's got a, a crystalline lobby, and then it's got all of the galleries over here, which are big, flexible, simple galleries. So, so you basically go from the plaza um, through the crystal, which is a buffer zone as well in terms of acoustics and in terms of um, thermal issues, and then you go up into the galleries. So, um, yeah, I don't need to do that. But we looked, in this case, at a lot of passive measures that we could do inside of the space in terms of plantings and water, um, Things, things from Islamic architecture as well as Chinese architecture. Like, what, what can we do in the space to, to uh, increase the, the thermal performance of the space, and the amb thermal ambience of the space? So, so we just sort of gave an example of how it might start to look planted and with pools and, and things like that that would um, generate evaporative cooling and also psychological have psychological cooling effects. So structurally, we looked at um, at the way that the surface of the uh, of a cantilevered roof could begin to differentiate into these pleats that would branch and reconnect in different areas. And we thought, as a, as an interesting model, that a carpet is pretty interesting in terms of of the way that it's optimized. It's aerodynamic on the top, and on the bottom, it's got a it's got a second plate which is punched and folded in such a way that it increases performance of the hood. So that was our idea for the for the structure, and we also let it flow across the whoops, sorry, let it flow across the roof. So it became a branchy system of pleats across the whole building. Um, so the south side of the building is very shut down to eliminate the, the sunlight coming in. So it's very much open to the north side, and the, the south side is. So um, the plans are relatively straightforward in terms of the column grid, and, and they're, they're intended to be f extremely flexible, which was asked for in the program. And we, we took the liberty of kind of uh, designing ceilings in some of the spaces just to see how that would go, but otherwise leaving the, the floors open for the curators. So uh, the next project, called the Novosibirsk A and D Pavilion, was another competition. It was it was also in 2007 in the summer, and um, at that time we were looking at um, at, at Nervi again. Um, we'd recently been there actually with the class, and we were at St. Mary's Cathedral, which is an amazing concrete lamella or grid shell um, uh, design. And at the same time, looking at other kinds of biological patternings where you have a massive differentiation between cell shape and cell size, like on an alligator back, where you have armored cells on the back of the thing, which are very thick and rectilinear, and then you have very small round cells near the arms of the, of the creature, so you can move around. And so we use that as a point of departure for this pavilion that we did. Um, so here's one of our chunks of geometry that we made. It, um, it, it has a nice quality that there's massive cell, cell change, cell size change, but also it's got linear elements running through it. Um, uh, um, but at the same time, it's a kind of open-ended pattern. And that's something that's, that we've picked up on in quite a few projects, where um, you can have a cellular pattern, but you can also have, have linear elements running through it. So some other studies of how we might um, add curvature to the pavilion. Um, in order to support the shell. And then some studies of how we might have a larger surface with a couple of, um, of huge col columnar-like elements. They're not actually columns, but they're actually um, uh, inflections in the shell. And again, like transformation between surface to pleat to strands, which are glazed. And then some more studies of, of this kind of geometry, which goes from a branchy system to a radial system to a grid. And so here's the project. Um, again, we, it's basically a huge surface which is, which, is a, um, which is curved, which definitely helps it operate as a shell. And then it has these additional double curvatures twice in the roof, which, which assist in the structural performance. But then the idea of the patterning is that it responds to two things, both the curvature, so where there's more curvature, there's more cells, 
but it also um, responds in terms of depth. So, so where none of these systems is performing optimally, we can begin to, to vary the depth of the different members to, to, pick up the, to pick up the difference. So again, it's a non-optimal structure, but it has different ways where you can insert yourself in the design process and, and add variation in order to increase the performance of the piece. So, Yeah, so here it is from the street. Uh, that's the entry on the left. And at night, some of the patterning. Okay, so I think we're gonna, I'm not gonna show this. I am gonna, sorry about this. I'm gonna show PS1 for some people who haven't seen this. This is for me now a really old project, but um, I like to show it because it was, it was technically um, one of the earliest projects of my office. This is the PS1 gallery, which stands for Public School One. It's in, it's in Long Island City in New York. And I think probably everybody here knows about the PS1 competition. Um, uh, it's been done by a lot of people at this point. It's been going for 10 years. They're starting a new one again. Um, and it's an amazing um, opportunity for young architects to basically build something in what is simultaneously the, the back like courtyard of PS1, but also kind of the front entry of PS1. So it's a very interesting space. Um, the, the, the program is that it should be a pavilion that provides a uh, water element and shade, and it becomes the home of the music festival called Warm Up in New York for about three months of the summer. So here's the, the finished piece from above. Um, the idea was to, looking at the space, it's basically walls and floors. The idea was to complete the space by adding a roof, which um, it just felt like it needed a roof. Uh, so we decided to do that, and, and then we, we measured out how big the roof would have to be, and we realized, well, okay, this is, we're talking about a really long span structure here. And so I think from end to end, the things, um, 140 feet or something like that. So we said, okay, so how do you do a long span roof um, uh, with almost no budget? And um, how do you do it without being hierarchical in terms of structure? So, so we decided to try to form a roof made out of gigantic cells. So in a way, upending the hierarchy, um, the, the, the hierarchy of primary, secondary, and tertiary structure, and trying to replace that with a, a gigantic cellular structure that was interconnected, and then wrap that with a very, very light skin with no structure on it whatsoever. So that was the agenda. And there was a lot of structural testing on this. This is very low tech at the time. Basically, we were going in and out of, um, of Erstab, which is the, the German version of RISA, um, doing finite element analysis in the model. And obviously, there are some areas where the thing is falling down, and that's where we would begin to add depth to the cells. So it was basically a, a really low-tech feedback loop with the engineers, uh, Bollier and Groman, and um, until we got it optimized. So here are the different cells. Uh, I can recognize sort of each cell based on um, its depth. You can, you can key its depth back to its location and plan, and based on where it was cantilevering or not, connecting to adjacent cells or not, or, or <coughs> those kinds of issues. So you can see that like, you know, the, the, there's one cell in the middle that's about nine feet deep, which is one of the ones that can't leave her out at the end. And you have to imagine that these cells are about 50 feet long, made out of aluminum pipe. So here's a model. Um, some of the construction documents as well. Um, this is showing constructed. So actually each one of these, of these guys. Um, the, there are cells here. It's a double plate construction. And they're, it, they actually look like this. This is the, <coughs> this, the, the shape of the cell. And then they mount into these beams, which lock them um, laterally. And the skin was based on looking at different kinds of minimal surface geometry, uh, particularly co um, conoid geometry and, and uh, parabolic geometry. So we decided to build the whole underbelly and the roof of this thing based on um, lofting either parabolas and line segments, um, line segments and rotated line segments, or two opposite parabolas. And we started to generate the belly of this thing. So the idea was, um, of course, these shapes are not, 
are not ruled surfaces, meaning they're not um, one, uh, one dimension of curvature, they're, they're, they're two dimensions of curvature, but um, certain materials are able to pick that up and you're able to bend them. And so we wanted a big search for different kinds of materials that would do that. And so the one that we landed on was expanded aluminum, which is a really cool material because it's um, at the minute you curve it, particularly in more than one direction, you give a little bit of torque, it becomes very stiff. So what you have is a whole series of little micro vaults on the underside of the roof here, which keeps it very stiff. All we had to do is connect it at the bottom with zip ties, and all of these vaults keep it from sagging, which was our biggest concern. So here's the, uh, the skin unfolded for that. It was mocked up underneath the bridge before we built it in PS1. There's some half cells we're trying to move. Um, couldn't move them to the site from where they were constructed because we didn't calculate for the, the low-hanging electrical wires <laughs> in Queens. So we carried them. Uh, and then here's some guys, actually ex IRC students, um, uh, uh, putting on. Actually, a lot of the construction team were IRC students that flew out to New York. That was great, um, putting on the skin. So one thing that we found out once we started playing around with this material was that it picks up light completely differently when you have it oriented one direction, it's, it's diamond shaped, one direction versus another direction. And what we found out is that um, we could create a day-night effect where it's rotated in one direction for the outer skin, and then the cells are also clad in the other direction, and then they have lights inside of them. So at, in the daytime, you read it as a, as a solid shade structure, and at night, you read the structural cells inside. So there's day. There's some of the pools. <coughs> and you see what happens. This is one of those events. And you see what happens towards night where the skin disappears and you can see the cells. Um, OK, so a similar but more recent project to that is Dragonfly, which was done for the Sire Gallery. So some of you may have seen that. Um, the project is probably less spectacular, but to me it was, it was, um, it was a bigger breakthrough in terms of the work of the office. Um, and that was a lot due to the, um, the cooperation with Burrow Happold, uh, which was really exciting for me, and it enabled us to start to really, um, really use some of the softwares that, that I've been wanting to use in terms of optimization of structures. Uh, but again, not to the ends of, of reducing weight or having a simple structure, which is um, what a lot of people use those for, um, uh, but rather to find out if it's possible to use those kinds of algorithms um, uh, to generate um, complex structures, which, which um, despite the fact that they're complex, also perform. So yeah, I mean, I described the, the dragonfly already, so you guys got that, the gist on that. Um, thinking again about structural hierarchies, which I do a lot. Um, uh, looking at how to, how to put a, a canopy inside of the Sire Gallery was, was sort of the question, if we were gonna do a, a canopy. Um, and so we thought, okay, you know, one way to do it is to do a tribiated structure with primary and secondaries. Um, very difficult to find supports for this thing. It really only wants to be supported on the ends, which wasn't possible in the gallery. Um, another version is an egg crate structure or a two-way plate. Um, this can be supported anywhere around the edges, but it's boring. Um, then another one is a honeycomb plate, which is very floppy, but it's really good if you vault it. Um, and you, make, you can make it very, very skinny at the top if you start to vault it. Um, uh, particularly if you don't have any cladding on it, it's very weak otherwise if you just leave it as a plate. So what we decided on, again, was this, this composite structure of something which has qualities of a two-way plate, but also qualities of this honeycomb plate. And um, also morphologically, it has some vaulting in it, and it also has some straight um, flat elements. So, yeah, so this was a starting point uh, for, for the piece. We did some studies uh, using some linear elements and some, uh, um, some, some Voronoi scripting to try to lay out a basic starting point that we could evolve it from. And, then we, we define some, um, some boundary conditions for the project, which basically means we weren't going to start to optimize it in all directions at once, but we wanted to optimize it in very specific ways, uh, one after the other to see, um, in, in no particular order actually, but one after the other to see how it would vary each time we ran one of these. So one of the ways that we, one of the boundary conditions 
was the overall shape of the piece, um, meaning uh, where is it vaulting, where is it flat, where is it fanning out, where is it connecting to the wall. Um, another one was where do we have four-sided cells versus five to seven-sided cells, and, and what kind of stiffness are we creating? How was that? Um, and then another one is uh, how are the veins distributed and, and the pleats. Another one is depth variability. And the last one, which I think is the most interesting, is the, the material thickness, uh, which is built up incrementally on the piece. So we, we set it up so that we have some extreme forces running through it. There's about 4,000 pounds of aluminum here. And we decided to um, just connect in the back of the space onto one of the concrete columns, onto the steel mezzanine, and then onto the corner pipe over here. So it basically cantilevers 50 feet. And so we thought that if we had some good, nice, strong forces running through it, it would force us to adapt um, out of fear more than anything else, fear of falling. Um, so, sorry I'm rushing through this a bit, but. So we set up, um, once we, we started running these boundary conditions um, in both analog ways and also using ANSYS, we also set up a model in CATIA that could be our fabrication model. And, and this was really useful. We set, up, um, we set up a surface on the top and the bottom of the model that could be moved. Instead of having to move all of these vertices, we had a, a very small set of vertices that we could move and adjust the depth so that you could push the surfaces together to make the structure smaller or pull them apart to make so this is what we did for the depth variability part of it and also for the shape variability. A really useful time saver. And so you can see how the thing started to, um, in a really interesting way, evolve over time. It took several, um, several months, actually, of development to get it to go from here, which was uh, already not even the starting point. This was already developed into something, something else. And you see some refinement going on here, some of which is, is, um, uh, is just uh, is from the engineering, and some of which is design, um, meaning being decided by the architect. But, uh, but the most interesting points for me are the ones are the ones that came directly from the engineering. Like for instance, there's this linear element here that's running through the honeycomb, which uh, the engineering model absolutely required to keep the whole thing together, which was really interesting. So it basically emerged here in the in the vault. Uh, yeah, here's some of the, the ANSYS models. Of course, we're looking to get everything blue to, to um, equalize the energy flow and the buildup of, of, of uh, stresses in the piece. Some of these pieces even dropped out towards the end, um, but some, so we had to react. Um, this, is a, this is pretty far along, though. And we had to react at the end to these red zones in the structure. And we did this through the last boundary condition, which was the buildup of material. Um, now, the thing was made out of eighth, eighth inch aluminum, which was milled at the Cyrex shop. And we milled in all of the construction information into these plates, including the part number and including the angles here so you could bend the pieces into cells. And those were scored as well, so it could only be bent in a certain direction. And then we made a lot of these guys. And let me flip forward here. We made a lot of these guys and began to build them up. Oops begin to build them up, this is a zoom in of a plan, in certain areas over other areas. So right here, for instance, there's a single plate, as opposed to here where there are four plates built up. And that's not just a trick of, of fabrication where we needed to have a bunch of these overlapping. We actually did this based on the engineering. So that was our sort of final fine tuning of the structure, which was very valuable um, for us, in terms, especially at the support locations where we had up to seven or eight or nine layers of aluminum. But again, this was a last measure. It's not like we started throwing material at the thing to solve the structural problems. We did this as, as the fine tuning measure after we had already optimized it in terms of cell density and shape and all those other things. So, so there it is being built. There's some sire faculty. So, okay, so there it is. Um, you know, I'm not going to do this one. I'm going to skip past this. I'll do this one. So this is a project which, which we did this summer, and it was just pure research, uh, no competition here. And it was done um, with, with a student of mine, Anna Kirtle, who may be here, I don't know, um, 
who was very interested in uh, freshwater greenhouses, which is basically a very low-tech um, way of generating fresh water. You take advantage of the, of the evaporation condensation cycle um, of, of, uh, of, of the atmosphere that you find naturally occurring in the environment, and, and you basically generate fresh water out of it and remove the salt. So, so we decided to focus in on, on, a, on a zone of the world which is um, really having trouble now in terms of fresh water, and that's definitely the Middle East, in particular um, Abu Dhabi and the UAE in general. Uh, where they have catastrophically low levels of fresh water and they are having to expend a huge amount of fossil fuels in the generation of fresh water there. And what that means in reality is, is you have things that look like oil refineries on the, on the shores of, of Abu Dhabi, uh, um, which are then also expelling salt back into the ocean and killing the ecosystems there. Um, so it's a, it's a kind of huge dilemma, and it's not, it's not just a dilemma there, it's also on a lot of islands uh, as well, which have no fresh water. So, so we decided to make um, a project based on, on this on natural condensation and the fact that when water condenses, um, the salt is gone from it, it's always fresh water. So, so there's, a, um, there's this, this freshwater greenhouse idea basically works like this. You, uh, first of all, you have to find a position on the ocean front. You have to have access to very deep, cold water in the ocean. And you also have to have warm air coming in from, from the ocean as well. So uh, you, you, you mine this cold water and you run it up through tubes. Then you, um, you let air, warm air come in through a mesh. And then you um, add additional water to it, so it becomes very, very humid. And then the water basically starts to condense on these pipes, and it runs down and is collected at the bottom. So this is salt-free water, and you can just collect it at the bottom. Um, so we started with a, a structural principle, a kind of frame, a lattice frame, which, which would, would be this, uh, this cold water network. It's, a, it's an interconnected tube frame with, with continuous water flow. Um, so it's one big continuous tube, actually, running cold water. And we decided to, uh, in addition, create a pleated, a pleated shell that would begin to um, encapsulate all of that structure and create a, a greenhouse so we get a lot of hot air in there that takes a lot of water um, and would, would speed up the process. So it's a kind of greenhouse with a lot of glass. And at the same time, the shell has pleating in it which can direct the flow of water dripping off of this network. So here's the piece. Um, it's really not well worked out. It's just a concept right now, and it's being shopped around by a broker in the Middle East. Uh, but here's a picture of the, of the structural network that's basically dripping water into this kind of a pleated network, which is collecting the water and bringing it back to the source. So, so the idea is to make a cultural icon out of the thing. Yeah, uh, but at the same time, it's also a machine for generating water. And um, we haven't calculated yet how much water it actually generates, but that's also not quite the idea of it. The idea is just to bring it into the public eye and, and, um, and talk about these, this kind of very low-tech, high-tech kind of solution for desalinization. So there it is at night. So it's a flying greenhouse. Um, I'm going to, what am I doing on time? Eight. Okay. I think I'll skip this guy too. Sorry about okay. This is a project that I was working on this summer, <clears throat> thanks to Yan Song Ma from MAD in China. He brought together ten architects from around the world to Guiyang, which is this beautiful um, Chinese city. This is just outside of Guiyang, these spiky mountains. Um, to basically be part of a huge development there that's going on. And uh, so we worked on that for a few months this summer. Um, exciting project, the, our, our part of the project was a 110 meter tower office space. And, um, and so, uh, so we began with an, a new kind of interest that I have in something which everyone I think thinks has been put to rest or has been buried or or hopes will never come back again, and that structural <laughs> expressionism. Um, it seems to keep, I, I keep coming back around to this image, uh, which is, of course, um, Lloyds of London from Richard Rogers. 
And it's somehow horrifying, but also interesting to me. Um, the thing that's really horrifying about it is the fact that the mechanical and structural systems, mostly mechanical systems, have been um, pushed to the outside of the building, but they've been pushed in a way that, that it, it, they've been pushed wholesale, actually, outside of the, the interior of the building to the exterior. And the strange thing about it, the kind of almost perverted thing about it, is that, um, is that a lot of these ducts are intended to look like ducts that would be on the interior, but of course you have to go to great lengths to have ductwork like this on the exterior. You have to double insulate them um, and, and do all kinds of things to, to make sure that they still operate. Um, and also, of course, thermally it operates completely differently when they're not insulated inside of the building. So what you have here is, is someone going to great lengths to, to expose the infrastructure of the building. Um, and, and somehow um, it's, it's, it's related enough to what, what, where my work has been going that I'm at least trying to take it on and figure out what, what, what that's all about. Um, but with the caveat that, that um, I guess I'm much more interested in kind of pattern logics that are going to be m much more integrated um, with skins, like patterns and skins and surfaces. So, so these two things, which you know, don't really have much to do with one another, I guess, were the start of this project. And so we talked a lot about tattoos and a lot about mechanical engineering. Um, so here's one piece of geometry that we made, which has mega pleats in it. These guys, and then also micro pleats, uh, which were intended to be parts of the mechanical system of the building. So this was—it was kind of unclear what this would become, but that was the idea. And so we thought, okay, um, we're doing an office building. We're going to do a very optimal central core, uh, as they do in China, and we're going to have peripheral columns. And um, the, the main thing that we're going to do in this project is to. Um, is to push the mechanical system out into the exterior. Um, but what we wanted to do is do it in such a way that we're not just literally pushing uh, mechanical ducts to the outside to say, hey, look, there's a duct. Um, we wanted to do it in a very atmospheric way. So we started to talk about color and light, and we added also a secondary shroud here to, um, to create all kinds of silhouette effects and color and depth effects. Um, these are some models of how the, the, the mechanical system might, might run across the surfaces. It also became, uh, became the structural system, not the entire structural system, but, but basically a series of super columns running across the, the, the facade. And here's where we got a little bit more in depth um, about how it might work. We, we decided to eliminate ductwork, ceiling ductwork in the tower completely and replace it with floor plenums, which is also a really standard construction in China. And, um, and so we got rid of all of that stuff. And with that, of course, as people know, when you remove ceiling ductwork, you can also get very high ceilings. And you, um, and you can also um, increase the overall economy of the building. Um, so these guys, the, the red things, are structure. They're also mechanical. And then these little fine guys are basically what happens if you unwind a condenser coil on the roof of a building, which you always see. So it's a gigantic condenser coil, which basically exhausts heat from the building air conditioning system, which was a given. We had to have a, a, a central air conditioning system. Uh, so this, this becomes a gigantic um, uh, heat exchanger. And in detail, here's how this guy would work. Um, here's the outer shroud, the outer skin. There's a space in between. Here's the envelope going around here, which is glass. And then inside is a precast concrete element, which is the structural member. So basically what you get is a, is a delamination of the skin here, which breaks into two different kinds of constructions. And then there are openings in these structural precast members, which, which um, allow you to, to feed air in from these ducts into the plenum. And then nested inside of all of that is a fiberglass duct where the air actually flows inside. So, um, and you have lighting inside of that. So there are many layers to the construction, all with the intention of creating a kind of um, atmospheric mechanical system. So here it is in the daytime. This is the yeah, Ansel Miles Tower in the back. This is our tower. Um, and then here it is at night from the side where you start to see the mechanical system through the shroud from the back. You see there's also some other structure in there, which we added and we're not worried about it, which is 
Again, it's, it's not an over, it's a system that takes care of most of the structure, but there's an additional structural system, which is really quite banal, and it doesn't bother me at all. Now, the last project I want to show is, um, is one that we just recently finished uh, for the Taipei Performing Arts Center. And this is a really weird competition because it was judged within three days of turning it in. And there may be people here who did it as well. Usually these things take a couple of months. Um, uh, so that was strange. It's strange to be able to show it now instead of six months from now, which is usually the case. Uh, and so, so it's kind of fresh. It's, um, again, it's the, it's the Taipei Performing Arts Center. And basically the program was to, um, it's not in the center of Taipei, but it's not too far away from the center. So it's a pretty urban site. It's a pretty exciting site. And this is the, the Shilin Night Market, which people may know. It's the kind of nighttime farmer's market of Taipei. This is a major train line, and this is the site. So um, the program asked for three huge theaters. There's a, um, there's a gigantic um, uh, a proscenium theater, there's a smaller proscenium playhouse, and then there's a multi-form theater, which is basically a black box. And then they asked for the main entry and, um, and the whole building to open up towards this night market up here and also towards the train, which is where most of the people would come from. So the basic layout of our building was to stick to the sort of prescribed diagram in terms of the layout of the theaters and, and try to work out um, how to link them together um, using some of the other programmatic elements that they gave us, including um, some other cultural kinds of things like museums, but also shopping and restaurants and all of these kinds of things. So, so, um, so this is the project. Uh, it's, it really is a box that, that holds the theaters, that it's incredibly functional and well laid out in terms of uh, the delivery and in terms of the backstage and all of that. Um, and then we have this much more articulated space in the middle, uh, which we're calling a concourse. And the concourse is a circulation um, network connecting all the theaters together, but it's also programmatically independent. And, um, and it allows, it's a kind of urban space that's up off the ground. So, so it's, a, it's a bridging element that creates a plaza down below. So um, this is the thing from the roof uh, um, showing how it actually lifts up off the ground, not just in the middle, but also towards the end here to open up towards the night market, which was really important. And then at the same time, it's much more blocky on the other, on the other ends of the site to respond to this kind of um, uh, uh, rough, rough and blocky type environment. So here's the layout of the three theaters. And this is that centerpiece here, which is all organized um, with escalators and its own circulation system, but at the same time, it links into the theaters at all of these, these ends right here. So here's the, the underbelly of the thing, which was the crux of it, uh, being underneath the building um, or being up inside of the roof of the building up here. And we started to use this idea of tattoos again and of, of kind of, 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 uh, of flows of pleated elements running across the thing, but also, again, a micro and a macro scale. So we have these sort of micro pleats running across the surfaces, but also these gigantic armatures, which are circulation elements, which move people from floor to floor inside of this thing. Um, there's the more gradient from. Um, uh, in particular from the edges of the building over here, which were more gray, um, and then more and more intense towards the middle. And here's a view from underneath the plaza, and another view as well. And we also made some mistakes along the way and couldn't quite figure out how to do the color mapping correctly, which turned out to create some really interesting, almost kind of Mayan patterns across the skin over here, which were unexpected, but welcome. So this is the main view of the plaza and the, the concourse connecting all the theaters, which I like very much. And then here's the mesh work, which I realize that um, it's, a, it's just a simple first idea of how the structure might work, where we have a kind of straightforward uh, mesh shell over, over concrete theaters for acoustics. And this mesh shell would start to begin to um, be stiffened by all of these pleated members, which are, um, which are, are, are 
custom steel beams which are embedded inside of this meshwork. So you see that they, they're, they're much more intense and they're, they're more numerous here in the middle where, the, where, um, where it's bridging between the theaters. And, um, and in terms of the, the energy of the building, uh, um, obviously we wanted to have very tight thermal control inside of the theaters. But at the same time, we wanted to be able to, um, to save energy and to make the, all of this concourse element indoor-outdoor, kind of a winter garden environment. So, so we, um, we also decided to, um, that these holes, these huge apertures in the belly and also on the roof would be really good for circulating, circulating air through. So it's a, it's a winter garden atmosphere where it has single glazing on it. Um, uh, and it's enclosed from the rain, but it's also um, it's naturally done. So here's the, here's the view of the thing from across the street from the train. And um, as I said, we, we did not win this project. Uh, there's, a, there's a second round going on right now. Uh, so, but, but it was exciting for us and we learned a lot on this project. And I think this is the last one that I'm going to show tonight. Although I wanted to mention that, uh, I wanted to self-promote, that this is a book coming out from the office very soon, actually I think in a few weeks, which was a big project for, for my office this summer and it was really exciting to make. Um, a really great chance through a Chinese publisher. And um, also one other thing that I wanted to mention, there's uh, <laughs> attached to my office, people may or may not know about this, is, is, uh, is a new business called Crystalline, which does rapid prototyping, which I wanted to uh, pump a little bit. Um, the, the main reason for Crystalline though is that, is that I, I noticed in my own work in the last year or so that it's become more and more and more digital and we've been more and more reliant on renders um, to do projects and I'm starting to lose touch a little bit with the work so I'm, I'm intently interested in getting physical models back in play and so we decided to just go for it and also um, offer that as a service to other people in the community. So, less focused necessarily on structural or aesthetic or formal um, operations, but potentially the ability of this work to actually start to shape or reshape cities. Yeah, I don't know quite what you mean by systems in, the, in this case. But well, you referred to, and, and it's the yellow, I'm thinking of the yellow axon. You referred to the ability now to use structure to coordinate public movement. Right, right, yeah, exactly. Um, I guess this, um, the, my interest in geometry isn't, isn't just a kind of fetish. I guess I'm always thinking of these, these different hybrid geometry chunks that we're working on in terms of what they can do. And so um, in this case, this was a, a classic surface to armature kind of geometry. And at the same time, um, um, we knew that we were going to be moving thousands of people around and, and between theaters. So, so it was a good, a, good, a good match. Now, how you do that, I guess, is everything. And so, so it was. In, this, in the case of that project, it was really important that, that the building mass can be relatively simple and that we have a really articulated area, uh, which would become, um, create a kind of public intense zone, but at the same time move people up above. So yeah, I mean, I, I guess, I, I don't know if that's a, well, I, I guess it is an urban gesture. Yeah, and I think where I'm going with it is, I mean, do you see potential in your work for generating urbanism? No, uh, uh, no, no, <laughs> at all. I, in fact, um, I'm always, I cringe Why? a little bit when, when um, architects um, 
do urbanism. Um, I know some, some of them can do it, and people are interested in doing it, particularly um, of a certain generation. People seem to get more and more interested in that. Um, I, I, I personally don't think, um, in general, that, that when people, uh, um, in, particular, in particular designers, when they mess with the natural order and development of cities, um, that they've done much good, and I think that, that in the, I think, um, you know, my role as, a, as an architectural designer, I think it, it's, it's fine for me. I don't, I don't want to, I don't, I wouldn't pretend to know um, how cities generate. I wouldn't pretend to know uh, what kind of catalyst you need to put in place to make things gener uh, uh, generate correctly. Um, and I think it's also just enough to understand all the changes in our field right now, and all the, the technologies and all the, the things that are going on in terms of energy and everything that I, it's like one more thing that I just don't have a focus for, personally. I don't so, believe, I, I don't don't you believe that. Don't you think that you are, but don't you think that, uh, that, that when you have a piece of architecture in the city that it would, it would also affect There's, there's no question, and there's no question that when I'm talking about plazas or trying to, you know, encapsulate spaces, that that's a definitely an urban gesture. I was talking more literally about, you know, being able to design um, cities, um, and I think that there are also a lot of people interested in computation these days who, who are actively trying to design cities through computation, and I, I'm definitely not interested in that. Um, and. You know, I, but but I think there's no question that I'm interested in urbanism in terms of the, the way that the building interacts with with flows of people and with with public spaces. There's, that there's no question. Um, I have a question about your, you know, the, the interest that you have lately uh, has to do with how the city performs, particularly with you know, uh, <coughs> uh, with uh, acting as a so. The last part that you showed it, that, that you would have the mechanical system which is kind of pushed out to the outside of the skin that you can incorporate in that. And I'm, 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 I'm wondering if, why would you not, would you be interested in the future to bring that inside of the building? Because, because of, it's particularly a large and large scale project that. Um, if you have a mechanical system, it's not enough for the mechanical system to perform on this deal, And and would you be interested in doing that with the internal of the interior systems that that's one of the problems? Especially in, in in Asia when they have all of the heated core and why would you not um, extend that um, vocabulary? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's that's definitely possible. Uh, there's no question. Um, in fact, I, I would even argue that that maybe the future of mechanical systems is to just really not see them, and that they become much more ambient in general. Uh, but but in the case of this project, um, when you know you have a client who is interested in uh, um, central air conditioning, and that's a given at the front, and um, you've got to do floor plenums. You either put it in the central core or you put it somewhere else. And so the idea was to was was by letting it meander to the exterior, we could also use it structurally um, and also atmospherically. So yeah, I mean, it, there's no question that it, that it could be more even more deeply inside, and that could have different kinds of spatial effects. I'm sure. Uh, but you know, it's a it's it's a tough thing um, when. Uh, uh, I mean, I guess we, we don't really know where everything's going with mechanical systems, but definitely in terms of natural ventilation and in terms of, of uh, trying to just reduce duct work in general, I mean, I think that's definitely a goal, but that wasn't a goal of this, of this project. And in fact, um, I, I would say that, the, um, that, I, that that project wasn't necessarily innovative in terms of mechanical systems in general because the ducts are, in fact, still there. So the, the, the goal here was, was more of a combination of the two systems and the, the architectural effects that that can have. Yeah. Excuse me. 
Yes. You mentioned a few of different software like Katia, Ansys, and so on. Could you talk a little bit about the different software you use for modeling, construction documents, and so on? Well, um, there uh, a lot. I mean, a lot of a lot of the software that is used um, on these projects is uh, is the same stuff that you'll find around here, and the same stuff that you'll find. Um, you know, in Hollywood, it's it's a lot of animation software, and a lot of rendering software, and a lot of 3D modeling software. So um, it's 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 nothing particularly special, um, except when we construct things, it tends to be things it tends to be things which um, are more uh, uh, parametric based. Like the the Dragonfly project that I showed um, was done in Katia, and that was really important that we did it in Katia because we had. Um, because we had set it up for ourselves that we wanted to make constant changes until the very end in terms of the engineering. And if you use a regular, a regular kind of modeling software, you just can't do that. You can't pick up all the changes um, in, in time. It's just not possible. So that was really interesting for me to find a use um, for, for Katia because I, I still don't think it's, it's a great design software, but it was really useful in terms of the optimization process. Uh, so that's, that's something that I'm interested in. Um, and also, um, some of the things that I showed tonight um, are done with, um, with uh, sort of um, uh, custom scripts that we developed in the office, um, but not very many things. Uh, a lot of the stuff is handmade, you'll find as well. So I wouldn't say there's one software that I, that I have allegiance to or that I'm interested in promoting, but there's, there are a whole bunch of different ways of working. And it has more to do with, with I guess, the own history that we've created in the projects and the interests in mechanical systems and structure and patterning. And uh, that's kind of what's driving the work. This, the software is amazing, and it allows us to make these projects um, convincing and relatively quickly. Uh, but I wouldn't say that, that, like I said, that any allegiance to particular software brands or labels is, is that important um, to my office. So. Yeah. Anybody else? Hey, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I see that what you're doing is, is you're utilizing like a, a lot of stylized elements, um, and uh, in some ways, sort of like a, somewhat of a return to nature. In one way or another. Um, but I'm wondering if you're using any uh, cradle to cradle technologies or uh, the, the actual materials in the process that, other than just the elimination of certain or the efficiency of certain structures. Yeah, I think there are so many people working on that issue right now. In fact, um, my, my wife is working on that issue right now in terms of package design and those kinds of things. Uh, there, are lots of, there are lots of people interested in that and lots of people working on that. Now, I'm not an applied materials researcher, and I am more than happy to use, um, to use uh, um, uh, um, sustainable materials. That's great, but that's just not really what I'm, what I'm working on. I think that if you're going to do serious research in that area, that you've got to do, you've got to really focus on that because there's so much stuff out there. There's so much nascent technology. Um, there are so many opportunities, but they haven't really been brought to market in a way that makes them totally available. You know, and, and the construction industry is still kind of business as usual. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't pretend that I could sort of, you know, juggle that extra ball on the side of, of what I'm working on already. Um, but I'm super excited about what other people. Is that it? All right, guys, thank you. Thank you.